All right, welcome everybody. So today we're gonna to be talking about production and cost. And essentially this, this continues to get to our unit question of where do prices come from uh, by continuing to drill down into uh, the supply curve. So uh, in, in the last lecture, we talked about some of the determinants of supply, uh, those things that help suppliers to come up with what their supply curve is going to be. And production and cost are essentially uh, uh, add more depth to that, that it shows where exactly their costs and then the production levels that they want to set uh, come from, which will, once we put it with demand, help us to figure out uh, where how markets end up with that stuff. All right, so uh, first to define some terms here. Uh, economists typically define business decisions as being in either the short run or the long run. Uh, so you can probably kind of get an idea of what those are just from the name, uh, but economists define them a little bit differently. Uh, that in the short run, there are certain fixed resources or fixed costs, uh, and then there are also some variable resources. So let's say I'm going to be using the example of having a coffee shop throughout this. If you have a coffee shop, uh, you've already bought the building or, or rented it out, whatever, you've bought your machines, uh, but you could certainly make decisions about uh, maybe how many hours to be open, uh, how many workers to have, decisions like that. Uh, so, so that is the short run. You've got at least something that is fixed. In this case, it's our building. In the long run, uh, there are no fixed resources. So basically that's the kind of like the sky's the limit. There are, there's nothing but variable resources. Uh, looking at the long run with our coffee shop, uh, you could uh, move into a new space, maybe smaller or bigger space. You could uh, move to a new city. You could uh, stop making coffee at all and start selling Jamba juice. I, I don't know, but you could do anything. There is nothing that is fixed. So uh, we're gonna be talking about the short run for the first half of this here, in which there is at least, again, something that is fixed. Uh, in the scenario I'm gonna give you, uh, the only variable that we have is the number of workers. Uh, so we're gonna be thinking about having our coffee shop running for just one single hour, uh, just gonna make the math easier, uh, and they're only going to be selling lattes. Again, it makes the math easier. Uh, so uh, in this case, again, our variable here is the number of workers, uh, and the total product is the first uh, kind of term that you should know. Uh, this is simply the number of lattes that they are able to serve in this time period. Uh, so if we have zero workers, obviously you can't make any lattes. Uh, if you've got one worker, let's say that that worker can sell 20 lattes in 60 minutes. So it, it took them like three minutes per latte, whatever. If you have two workers, then suddenly they're able to sell 60 and on and on and on. So it keeps going up for a certain amount of time. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to it to where it starts going down. The marginal product is, this is the kind of more econ term that you should absolutely know. Marginal product is the additional lattes served by that employee. Uh, so, so remember what marginal means, it's something on the edge, one more or one less of something. So as, as we e add each additional worker here, how many more lattes are we getting? So going from 20 to 60, well, that's 40. Uh, the next one, going from 60 to 110, well, that's 50. Okay. Uh, and this is in a period called increasing marginal returns or increasing returns. You'll notice that each of these numbers is bigger than the last. That means that each of these first three employees is more productive than the last one. Why could this be? Well, our, our favorite word back here, specialization. Imagine you have one worker who has to ring people up, then run over to the espresso machine, 
make that espresso, grab some milk, steam it, uh, pour it into a cup, yell out the customer's name, put it on the table. Uh, maybe they have to go empty the trash at a certain point, uh, clean up some tables. Uh, so they've got a lot of different stuff to do, and they're kind of jumping between different tasks. Uh, whereas if you can differentiate this a little bit, maybe have one person working the register and the other person working the espresso machine, uh, they're, they're each going to be a little bit more efficient. Uh, add a third person, that person could maybe take care of the entire shop, whatever, you know, clean up tables, etc. So uh, again, increasing returns, increasing marginal product. Our, our marginal product goes up with each of these workers. Uh, but then in a very important economic concept kicks in. This is like the most important thing in terms of short run decision making. Uh, so uh, imagine the, uh, the owner says, holy cats, this is awesome. Uh, as I add more workers, we are getting more and more product out. Uh, then he adds his fourth worker. And this worker is only able to kick out another 30 lattes. And then a fifth worker. This worker is only able to kick out another 10 and then five uh, until you get to the seventh worker where this worker, they're kind of just jammed in here like sardines. They don't know what to do. They're asking people questions. Uh, they're standing in the way. This worker actually hurt their production by 15 uh, lattes. So this period here where the marginal product is going down but the total product is still going up just by somewhat lesser amounts, you know, 30, then 10, and then 5. This is a product called diminishing return, or a, a period called diminishing returns. And then finally, again, at a certain stage, you're going to be getting negative returns. Uh, so, somebody who is, you know, just so in the way that uh, they are hurting overall output. All right, let's add a little bit more here in terms of uh, the costs. So uh, we were looking at the production before, you know, how much are they putting out? Here, we're gonna add cost to it. So we've got the same uh, basic numbers here. Uh, I just copied in the marginal product. I cut out that seventh worker because you don't want them anyway. And I've got the six workers here. So in, uh, our short run production, we do have, again, some sort of fixed cost. I just said, okay, uh, how about a hundred bucks for uh, keeping the restaurant in existence for one hour? You could either be closed for that hour, it's still gonna cost you a hundred bucks, uh, or you could ha hire however many workers you want. Uh, I picked out $15 an hour here. And then, so you just add the variable cost and the fixed cost up to get your total cost. Very, very simple. Uh, we've got our marginal product numbers here. And then this, this is just some kind of math here to show you how I got to this next one, marginal cost. Uh, but if you divide the change in total cost, uh, so this would be uh, like, you know, to get from 100 to 115, that's 15, that's a change in total cost, uh, to the change in marginal product, and that's just the number that I listed over here. So you divide those two numbers to get your marginal cost. We know what marginal means, one more of something, we're thinking on the edge. So basically what marginal cost is showing here is how much each of the lattes that this worker kicked out cost. So for my first worker, how much did it cost me, a business owner, for each of those 20 lattes that they sold? And the answer is 75 cents. It's just, you know, the, the math dividing these two numbers. Our second, uh, so uh, this is 15 each time because each worker costs another 15 bucks. Um, goes down to 37 and a half cents, then 30 cents, then 50 cents. So uh, they go down and then they start to go up. Our marginal revenue is going to be the exact same uh, for each of these. Uh, because in a market, uh, we're selling each of our lattes for the same price. 
uh, in this entire unit, we're working only basically with markets where there's one single market price and that's what everybody from any supplier pays, but don't worry about that just yet. So uh, I'm going to draw a couple graphs here that you will not have to draw again, but this will uh, kind of help this make a little bit more sense. So we've got our same market graph here. Uh, the marginal cost curve always looks something like that, where let's say this is the 75 cents where it starts. That is terrible writing. Uh, then it goes down to 30 cents here at the nadir, uh, and then it keeps going up and up and up. Let's pretend that our uh, the, the marginal revenue, the, the price per drink, is two bucks. So for every latte that we sell, the business gets two bucks. So the marginal cost curve and the marginal revenue, your price, helps you to lead you to this magical thing called the profit maximizing output. It is just as obvious as it sounds. It is the output which maximizes profit. <laughs> and that happens right here at the confluence of these two uh, graphs, the marginal cost and the marginal revenue curve. Uh, so in this case, you can see that at two bucks per latte, uh, the sixth worker is not going to be worth it because their lattes are three bucks. So you would want to stop hiring workers after this fifth worker to get as close as we can here to uh, profit maximizing output. To take a quick glance at the long run, uh, again, nothing is fixed. This, uh, this business could make any kind of decisions that they want to. Uh, and a huge part of this is thinking about economies or diseconomies of scale. And these are terms that you actually might even hear in everyday conversation. Uh, that basically as a business is thinking about its size, there are certain sizes of businesses which work better. Imagine trying to have a car company that uh, is just one person building cars by himself. That'd be pretty expensive, pretty difficult. Uh, it makes sense for something like cars to be produced by uh, a relatively large business. So as a car company would produce more cars, their, their cost per unit, their, their price would go down. Uh, and so this is an idea called economies of scale. Uh, now imagine you have a business that is just massive. Uh, we can even return to our, uh, our latte shop example. If you have the biggest uh, coffee shop, and I'm, I'm talking about a single shop here, uh, where there's, I don't know, 50 different registers and 100 employees back there and they're all just going nuts, uh, it'd be kind of hectic, kind of crazy, difficult to manage stuff. Uh, and that is an idea called diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies of scale is basically the point at which your organization becomes large, unwieldy, hard to manage, uh, and then you, you stop getting those gains from having uh, things built in some sort of bulk. And you can throw these together on a graph called the long run average cost curve. Uh, this isn't something you're gonna need to work with a ton, but basically we've got a couple different periods here. Uh, so the first period uh, is economies of scale. Uh, that's when your price is going to be going down as you produce more. Then you've got a middle period where uh, you are running at kind of a consistent uh, economy of scale. Uh, and then at a certain point, your prices are going to start going up again once you get into dis economies of scale. All right, so back to our unit questions. Where do prices come? Well, they obviously are going to come from uh, the cost of production uh, that a business faces. And now we have some tools for analyzing those both in the short run and the long run. And we can add those to our determinants of supply. Uh, and we'll get to pairing this up shortly with demand. If you'd like more info on this, just check out section 5.3 in your textbook. That's all.